Hello ladies, welcome to another ladies Bible class. Today we're going to look at Mark chapter 7 verses 1 through 23. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so, so much for this text. I thank you that we are free from the traditions of men. We are free to follow you with our whole heart. And Lord, thank you for cleansing us and thank you for what you're teaching here. I need you to fill me afresh with your spirit that you would teach through me. They need to hear from you, not me. So Lord, give me understanding. Speak through me all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have just come from uh, Jesus walking on the water, which was like one of my favorite accounts in all of the scriptures. And, you know, they were greatly astonished by this. The whole community in Galilee is in an uproar. And word is getting back to the leaders of the Jewish synagogue and community in Jerusalem. So there are some of their folks, as we read in chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around him when they had come from Jerusalem. So these guys hear about this. They're concerned, what is this guy? What is he doing? He's teaching with authority. He's, he's gathering attention. He is stealing attention from them. And he's teaching in a way that they're not real comfortable with. And if this guy's going to be a rabbi, if he's going to have students, if he's going to start his own divinity school or theological school or whatever they called them in that day, um, he needed to toe the line and be in line with them. So they are not coming to learn from him. They're coming to confront, challenge, and find heresy. That's what they're looking for. So they are not coming to be nice or to learn any of that. So the Pharisees and some of the scribes, they have gathered around him. Very confrontational kind of forum here. And so they, they had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands. That means that they hadn't washed their hands before they ate. And they're like, hey, this is basic 101, what you teach your disciples. Why aren't you teaching them this? And we get a bit of an explanation in the next verse. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing what? The traditions of the elders. And when they, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they had received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper pots. So there was a lot of different traditions of washing that were handed down by the elders. This is not in keeping with the law of Moses. The washings that Moses gave were for the priests in their process of temple service and the worship service. It did not pass on to the common people. Okay, It was not something that had to be given over to anybody who wasn't actually carrying out the temple rituals. So they were really taking what Moses gave us and then adding to it. They were, they were basically creating a structure of legalism that Moses, and honestly, God, didn't give them. And so these became the traditions of men. Okay? And if it's a tradition of man, then it's not a command of God. If it's a tradition of man, man's more important than God. Okay, I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm not saying that traditions are bad in families or whatever. This is what we always do. It's not a law, and it's not what makes a person righteous. So I'm not going down that rabbit trail. So they challenge him on the hand washing thing. And again, if he's going to call himself a rabbi, they expect him to toe the line and teach the disciples the same thing they're teaching the disciples. 
And he goes on and he begins to confront them. Let's go over to verse 5. So the Pharisees and, ask, and, and scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Why? You know, hand washing. Hand washing was the issue. Why aren't your disciples doing that? He answers them, and he, and he goes to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. And he says to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Who? not a nice term. Remember, it, the, the Greek in, the hip, in hypocrite means someone who would put a mask on, but it, it was a pretense. They wanted to look one way, but behind the mask, they looked completely different. And this is what the actors in the early Greek tragedies and stuff, they would wear a mask. And they were, they were called hypocrites. They were ones who, who presented themselves. They were acting. Presenting, this is, what I, this is what I look like, but this is what I really am. And so he calls them out on this. And he quotes the, the passage in Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips. Okay? You say one thing. But their heart is far away from me. So what you're speaking isn't matching what's really in your heart. In vain do they worship me. In vain they keep all these traditions. Teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. They were putting the traditions of men on equal footing, if not higher footing, is what Jesus is going to point out here, than the doctrine and the commands of God. I have been in churches that, that have been legalistic, and they have definitely done that. But I'm really not trying to be hard on anybody. What I'm trying to say is that we need to examine our hearts and make sure that we're not just giving God lip service, but that our hearts are truly His. That's what God wants more than anything, folks. If you hear nothing else, He wants your heart. He wants you to get to that point where... You are willing to do what he tells you to do when he tells you to do it in a strength for your glory. That is the mindset. That is the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. And it comes from having a loving, trusting, resting, abundant relationship with him. All right. Verse 8. He goes on, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. So not only are they neglecting, they're setting aside... And they elevate the tradition of man. And he points to this whole um, honor your father as his example. Honor your father and your mother. And he says that in addition to that, that the, the Mosaic law said, if you speak evil of your parents, it's worthy of being stoned to death. Okay, uh, God takes honoring the parents exceedingly seriously. And he points out to them and he says, look, you're setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Anything of mine you might have been helped by is korban, that is, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Okay, so I have not deep dived on the Korban thing, but what I am understanding is that, hey, you, I'm, I can't help you because all I have belongs to God. 
It's been dedicated to him as a gift. All I have is God's. Everything I have is God's. I can't help you. I can't take care of you. I can't pay for your uh, old folk home because all I have is God's. This is me speculating. Hear me say this. I think it's very likely that they would say all of my wealth, because these guys accumulate, they were pretty good at getting rich. Um, all that I have is God's, therefore I can't help you. I can't honor you. I can't take care of you because everything I have is God's. So that was a cover for keeping it for themselves, for being selfish. But his point here is, look, you are, are standing and setting, you're standing on traditions of men, setting them higher than what God's command is. And, and that's not cool. Because they elevate the doctrines of men over the command of God. And he's like, you do this all the time, is what he's telling them. You do this all the time. He's going to enlarge his, his uh, audience. And he's going to speak clearly on what defiles a man. What? Let's just switch it to a person. Okay. What the Pharisees taught was stuff from the outside in. Out to in. You know, what you touch. Or eat. Okay. This is why they would go into the marketplace, and just in case they touched somebody who was unclean, they would they would clean. They would get clean. Then you know, what if we touched this, that, and the other thing? They they had a lot of what, what ifs going on. And the common person, whoever they would bump elbows with, they would they would be like, oh no, what if they're unclean? And so therefore, I got to wash, and then go through all these ceremonial things um, in order to stay clean because they perceived themselves as elevated above. They were proud. They were arrogant. I'm clean. You're the commoner. You don't you don't you know, you could defile me because you don't know how to stay clean. He calls the, the multitude again. He says to them, listen to me. Listen up, all of you. He calls them to understand. And if you have ears to hear, you know, understand this stuff. He says, there's nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile him. Defilement. is already inside us. Okay? What comes out is the proof. That's his point. The Pharisees didn't get it. They didn't they thought they were pure and holy and when they came in contact with something unclean, that unclean thing, you know, made them defiled. He's like, "Oi, no." Nothing outside you can defile you. Your problem is you're already defiled from within. And that defilement leaks out of you. And therefore we need Jesus. In verse 16, um, some manuscripts add the verse, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, taken from some concepts in Isaiah, uh, but a frequent call from the Lord. So he, he leaves the multitude, he leaves the Pharisees and the scribes, he enters the house. His disciples begin to ask him about the parable. They're, they're seeking understanding. So we've gone from uh, the multitude. Gets the general explanation. Now we've got the D's and they're alone. And he gives them a big oi. Oi of A. Okay, that's what's coming. He said to them, are you too so uncomprehending? That's Oyave right there. Oy, do you still not get it? Do you still, are, are you guys still not comprehending? A little bit of frustration perhaps on Jesus' part. Um, but he goes on and he says, look, do you not see that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Now this is a, you know, to use a common phrase from a, a, um, 
that's going around today is, is get used to different, folks. You know, get used to different. What were they used to? They were used to the traditions. They were used to hearing what the Pharisees had said. They were used to hearing that in synagogue. They had to do all these washings and all that nonsense of the traditions of men. They were used to hearing that what you eat defiled you. you. They were used to having to keep kosher. They were used to all of that stuff. And I'm not saying that anything that was defined in the Mosaic Law is bad. What I'm saying is exactly what Jesus is saying. is this: look, what goes in your mouth doesn't defile you. It's what comes from the heart that points to the real problem. Whatever goes into the man from outside cannot, cannot defile him, but it does not, because it does not go into his heart, he goes into the stomach, and then it's pooped out. It's my version. It's eliminated. <laughs> it goes out into the latrine. Um, that's what my side note says. Now, in parentheses, Mark is saying that Jesus declared all food clean, that he is, again, new covenant as opposed to old covenant, doing away with the dietary laws, which means Jews should be allowed to eat bacon, which I eat bacon almost every day. Anyway, he was saying to them, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. It is the evidence. It is the evidence. It is the proof. What comes out, whoops, out of a man proves the defilement. What defiles us, folks? It's sin. What is God? Holy. If we had one word to describe God, I just shot a blog on this. It'll be going up on Monday. God is holy. Adam and Eve were holy. They were without sin. It is because of that that they were allowed to have fellowship and relationship with him. They experienced no pain in their life, no grief, no sorrow, none of it, until they listened to the serpent and gave in to his deception and they rebelled against God. And they're the ones that introduced pain into this world, folks. They're the ones that introduced sin and pain. Not God. If you're going through pain, don't blame God. Blame sin. Blame Adam and Eve. Get mad at them. They're the ones that introduced it. In this world, you will have what? Tribulation. Pain. Jesus says, cheer up. I've overcome that pain. And he did that on the cross. It is sin that has defiled us. It is sin that separated us from God at the moment of conception. It is the blood of the Lamb that has reconciled us to God by faith through grace because His blood paid the, set, the sin debt on our behalf that we might be reconciled, that we might be taken out of Adam, freed from the power of sin, born again into God's family, transformed from sinners to saints, that we might learn to put off the flesh, which is learned behavior, it's not a nature. The flesh is learned behavior. It's my default setting. When I'm functioning with a scarcity mindset, when I'm functioning with I have to get my needs met out here instead of resting in the abundance of my needs already being met vertically in my relationship with the Lord. That's the choice we make moment by moment every day. But when we get caught up in making that choice and we get fixated out here, and we live from our imposter, that defilement of the flesh will come through. We don't redeem the flesh. <laughs> we crucify. It. It's done. It's been crucified. But I have to choose to set my mind on that reality and live from the reality of the new man, my new person in Christ. The battles between the flesh and the spirit. I can either walk in my default scarcity setting of the flesh and say, I lack, therefore I'm going to look out here. And when I look out here, my heart is going to choose against God. It's going to choose things based on evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, deeds of coveting and wickedness, 
as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of those things are driven by a perception in our soul of lack. I need something to fill my soul up. I have something to fill my soul up in is Jesus. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's what empowers me. It's what fuels my engine. And I have no higher joy than doing the will of the Father. Beloved, you want to experience the joy of the Lord, walk in obedience in His strength. Align with Him. Ask Him, what's got me out of alignment? Where am I looking out here when I should be looking up here and resting on what I already have? Ask Him to show you the lies you believed. Ask, you to, ask Him to show you the labels you've owned that aren't true. Or how you've labeled things onto God that aren't true. I have had the joy over the last year of walking with people through the Journey Tools program and seeing so many lives transformed. We're getting ready for a big launch. Um, we're going a lot wider than we've been able to do so far. Please keep us in your prayers as we're trying to resolve some computer tech issues and programming issues. The enemy is fighting us at every turn. Uh, we are going to launch more and more groups in South Carolina, and then we're coming up to Pennsylvania. So folks in Pennsylvania, listen up. We're coming. This is so worth the cost of getting into this program. I can give you countless testimonies, but I'm not going to... We've had physical healings. We've had spiritual healings. We have grief healings. Just amazing things that God is doing as we're learning to clean out the yuck in our souls and learning to align with Him moment by moment, making choices in align with Him, functioning out of our real, who we are in Christ as opposed to the imposter flesh. These guys, these Pharisees, love their, we call it prime rib flesh, just try harder Nike approach to Christianity. You know, here's your list, all the things you're not allowed to do. Here's your Bible verse, go try harder. Shoot, that doesn't work. I'm not decrying the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. But if you're not tapping into the, the Spirit of the Lord and Him doing things through you, He is your source of strength. You can't try harder. If you're trying to live the Christian life, there's only one who successfully did, and that's Jesus. But when you approach your walk with the Lord, with, Lord, I can't do this without you. I'm not even going to try. So, Lord, thank you for being my strength. Thank you that you're going to do everything through me. Lord, show me what's on the agenda today. Lord, show me what is the strategy the enemy's deploying in my life. Lord, what are you doing in my life? Why are you doing it? What else do you want me to know? All the compasses helping us stay on track with the Lord. And then our second tool set, helping to clean out that toxic stuff, the lies that we believed about ourselves, about others, about God, the labels that we've owned that really aren't from Him, the tools and strategies of the flesh that need to be put off and replaced with abiding in Christ and drawing on His strength. It is a powerful, powerful program, folks. And I have, honestly, I've never seen anything like it in, in the 30 years of counseling. Again, it has taken what I have done for a long time, that was working quite well, and taken it to a whole new level of goodness. So, beloved, let's, let's put off the deeds of darkness. Let's put off the things of the flesh, because they don't work. And as Jesus points out, that all these evil things proceed from within. This is what proves the defilement of man. This is what proves the need for Jesus. Obviously, at this point in the account of Mark, Jesus hasn't died yet. But, beloved, like the, like the psalmist David, like King David said, in, in light of his giving in to the defilement of his heart and sinning with Bathsheba, his heart's cry was created me a clean heart, wash me. Create a clean heart in me. Beloved, he's already done that for us. If we've placed our faith in Jesus, he's already given us that clean heart. What needs to be transformed is the way we think, what we're taking our thoughts captive, because where we set our mind determines what we feel. And when our, our mind is in alignment with God, our emotions are in alignment with God, our will is going to be subjected to God. So as we go through and root out what are the lies, where am I not in alignment with the Lord? And then we make those adjustments as we're led by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit to do so. That's when we're going to experience more and more and more of the filling of the Holy Spirit and the abundance and the fruit of the Spirit is going to grow. 
We're going to experience his life and it's going to flow over to the people around us. Our relationships will get better. We'll get healthy. People see Christ in us and be saying, hey, what do you got? I want that. They're going to see the joy of the Lord and say, I want that. And you're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel. Or if it's a believer, you're going to have an opportunity to help them get free. Free from their flesh, free from their imposter, and learn to live life out of the real version of who they really are in Him. Beloved, ask the Lord to show you where you're giving yourself over to the traditions of men, where you're functioning in the flesh instead of in the Spirit. And if you need help, if you want more information on Journey Tools, just reach out, contact me, send me an email, give me a phone call, okay? I love you all. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you. Thank you that we are not under the law, that we're under grace. Grace and mercy are the, will prevail in our lives. Thank you that you have rendered a verdict on our account, and that's not guilty by virtue of faith in the shed blood of the Lamb. There is therefore now no condemnation because we're in you. I give you glory for that, Lord. I thank you that we've been set free from the law of sin and death. We've been set free from the defilement of sin. And we have been given a new heart, a new heart that's given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, continue to sanctify us. And, Lord, thank you someday you're going to glorify us. You're going to give us a new earth suit. I look forward to that. So, Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We magnify your name. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ladies, have a fantastic week. Lord willing, if he, if he tarries, we'll see you next week. God bless.